My brother in Christ, Darshan, spoke bravely about his struggles with mental illness, encouraging those who quietly suffered and whose voice brought awareness to those who had no understanding. Darshan sadly lost his life to mental illness in 2019. His witness inspired me to preach on a topic I would not have otherwise have chosen. Let's pray. Father, teach us to lament. Give us ears and words to wrestle with things we'd rather push away. Holy Spirit, be with us as we hear this message. Give peace to those who might have their pain brought to the surface. Comfort those who silently suffer due to stigma and judgment. Hold close and carry the broken hearts of those who have lost loved ones to suicide. Give strength to those who fight such thoughts. Soften our hearts when we don't understand others' suffering or when it would be easier for us to walk away. Lord, fill us with your compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. The 2015 Disney movie, Inside Out, is about a young girl's journey as she moves cities and schools. Initially, everything is exciting, but then those feelings start to fade away. Her emotions play characters in the movie, anger, fear, joy, disgust, and sadness. They band together and try their best to make her happy, with joy really trying to head the mission. Yet as the movie goes on, we realize that all of our emotions are important, that feeling sad can be just as crucial as feeling joy. Not long after the movie came out, Rashan and I were in Thailand on holidays and there was inside out merchandise everywhere. Except one character was not for sale, sadness. Every shop we stepped in, sadness was nowhere to be found, not even on the back shelf. While the whole point of the movie is that even sadness is crucial, sadness really doesn't mark it well. It's difficult to talk about and it's something we all try to avoid. If you think about it, it's not something that we like to talk about much in church either. I've suffered with ongoing bouts of depression since I was 18. And I found that some Christians don't know how to react to this. I've heard statements like, Christians only have reason to be joyful. Or, if you had enough faith, you would be healed. Such statements leave the sufferer feeling inferior to those who do experience healing. While complete healing is certainly possible, it's not always God's will for a person. So today we read from Psalm 88. It is a psalm of lament. Typically, laments follow a structure. They start out by crying out to God, then they confess their trust in God, and it ends in praise. Psalm 88, along with Psalm 39, are the only Psalms in the Bible that end in utter despair. Friends, the inclusion of these Psalms in the Bible validates the experience of a Christian suffering from depression. But not only depression, its inclusion in the Bible says that darkness, discouragement and despair can be part of the Christian life. So what was the author experiencing when he wrote this psalm? It's difficult to pinpoint the exact circumstance. The author speaks of his misfortune being there from youth and it's led to social isolation. From this, some scholars guess that it's leprosy. Others take insight from where the psalm is placed. So from Psalm 73 onwards, it tells of the Israelites being exiled from their land and the collapse of throne of David. 
The Israelites had put their hope in God's promise to deliver them through the line of David. At that time, with no Messiah in sight, this psalm could have been a cry out to God for what they thought was an unfulfilled promise. Either way, Psalm 88 gives us words to utter despair, be it in our own suffering or the circumstances around us. You might like to keep your Bible open to Psalm 88. Let's read verse 1 and 2. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. The psalmist opens with a personal and direct address to God. He puts his confidence in a God who he knows can save him and deliver him from his situation and who he knows can listen to his cries. In the midst of despair, we will see that lamenting, far from being faithless or sinful, is actually an act of faith. Verses three to seven. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. The image of a pit would have been thought of as a well. The psalmist's lungs are being filled with waves of thrashing water and desperate attempts for air become almost impossible. He feels like he is already at the grave, counted among the dead. Where does this disaster come from? The psalmist puts the responsibility of everything wrong, not on his own sin, not on an enemy, but squarely in God's hands. While I don't believe that God ordains evil, still every Christian must wrestle with this. How can our good God allow suffering when he has the power to stop it? And so here the psalmist expresses that pain. This pain is often worse than the circumstance itself. Verse eight. You have taken from me closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. There are some illnesses where everyone will come around and support you. The Christian with a broken bone, failing eyesight or heart problems is never told that their condition is due to a lack of faith. Hospital visits, meals, flowers and support come quickly. And then there are other sufferings where even your friends forsake you. You can be made the topic of gossip and bearer of shame. Verses 9 to 12. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Did their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? The psalmist questions God about the meaning of his existence. The dead cannot sing God's praises or tell of his love, his faithfulness or his righteous deeds. So he asks, why am I still alive? Experiencing what only the dead should feel, 
If I am alive, surely I should feel God's presence, but it is nowhere to be found. Usually, once the psalmist has cried out to God and wrestled with all they are feeling, then they see the silver cloud lining and the clouds start to lift. It is at this point that laments usually turn to praise. But here we read verse 13 and 14. But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? For the third time, the psalmist speaks of his unceasing and desperate prayers. These prayers are offered in the morning. The morning was a time one could expect God to act. Aren't his mercies and compassions meant to be new every day? Yet, nothing changes. God remains hidden. God remains silent. And instead of moving to praise, the psalmist feels like the one person he could count on, the one person who would never let him down, God, even he has forsaken him. Verse 18, you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Friends, if this is you right now, I ask you to continue to walk in faith, to continue to cry out to God, even when it feels like he has abandoned you, to continue to seek his face when all you are met with is silence. There are many who wrestle with the question of suffering and evil and walk away from God altogether, but to call out his name in the midst of despair is an act of faith. For those of you suffering from all sorts of illnesses, who have faced violence, a loss of a child, unimaginable loss and grief, those asking why God allowed such a terrible event to happen and why he did not intervene. Fellow wounded Christians, please keep calling out to God in faith. What brings beauty to this psalm is not that it ends in the way that we'd all like, but the unrelenting voice of one who refuses to deny God's existence, even when he is met with silence. Years ago in Germany, following World War II, a poem was found carved on a wall in a cell. This cell was a place where many Jews had hidden during the Holocaust. The poem reads, I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. When we are not given a chance to lament, or when we are not taught to lament, we are left to cope in whatever way we know. Friends, we cannot heal that which we keep buried. To lament is to treat evil realistically. It brings our pain before God who sees all, hears all, and knows all. To lament is to name Submit and give our wounds over to Christ, who understands. To lament is to cry out to God, remembering that he created the world good, and to look forward to our promised future, where there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. 
to lament is a practice for now as we step on shattered glass and instead as we wait for our promised future where we will walk among the streets of gold and the seas of crystal. But where laments are excluded from our songs, prayers, sermons, Bible studies, and our conversations to each other. Lamenting people are also excluded. Being vulnerable is hard, but we believe in a God that made himself vulnerable for us to relate to us. So my challenge for you today is to share your struggles with one another. Let's be different from a world that crowns reputation and strength. Let's speak, speak about our weaknesses and God's grace in it. Let's encourage each other and create spaces where it's safe to share what's really going on. Great heroes of our faith have gone through despair Job experienced periods of no comfort from God or his friends. David prayed, record my misery, list your my tears on your scroll. Moses and Elijah both confessed to God that they would rather die than live in the circumstances they were in. Neither were rebuked by God, but met with his love and provision. If you're thinking, Yes, but that's all from the Old Testament. Now that we have Christ, it's different. Well, then yes, you're right. But let's look at the difference that Christ makes. When Jesus hung on the cross, Luke 23, 49 reads, all the ones who knew him were standing far away from him. This is a close parallel to Psalm 88, where it speaks of God taking away his closest friends and making him repulsive to him. Our Christ humbled himself and came as a human to identify with us in our weakness. Thus, the Psalms are also Christ's prayer. When we read laments like Psalm 88, we can remember that Christ is our companion in our sorrow. When he cried from the cross, words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We remember that Jesus anguished at the silence of God. While Psalm 88 has no resolution to the answer of suffering, the answer to suffering is only resolved in Christ. When Christ died, descended into the pit and rose again, the world was changed forever. Now we know that Christ is with us even in our darkest, deepest pit, for he has tasted death itself. Psalm 88 expresses no hope in the darkness, yet Christ goes through the darkness so that we cry out to a God who understands. It is only when we acknowledge at times the harrowing evil and pain in this world that we can see more clearly the glorious hope of the resurrection that is on offer to anyone who calls on the name of Jesus. Jesus is our light in a world full of darkness. Friends, when you think of the risen Christ, how do you see him? How do you picture him? What do his hands look like? Are they strong and victorious? Or do you see the risen Christ as he appeared to his disciples with scars where the nails were driven through his hands? When we lament, 
We cry out to a God who weeps with us, whose heart breaks for us, who suffers for us and with us. A wounded God who even in his glorious triumph carries the marks of his suffering. If suffering so defined our precious saviour, then we can trust our suffering is defining us, even when we cannot understand it. The suffering we bear is not for waste in God's kingdom. After Jesus' resurrection, the scars on his hand no longer speak of pain and death, but speak of glory and transformation. We can trust, so shall our scars be for us. There is a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen.